Hey, everybody. I'm Alicia Halliday. I'm the Chief Science Officer of the um, Autism Science Foundation. And one of the things that we do at the Autism Science Foundation is help communicate the need for postmortem brain tissue to families. So um, AS ASF actually kind of manages the outreach and communication arm. And one of the things I do is try to make this brain tissue science acceptable to the community. I think that um, it's probably been a while for many of you who've really kind of delved into brain tissue research. So this is going to be a quick one. I'm standing between you and Dan Geshwin's talk, so I'm going to make it quick. Um, the Autism Brain Net is actually not one place. It's a series of four nodes across the United States. One's in at UC Davis, one's at UT Southwestern, one's in New York, and one is um, out of uh, Boston, where Matt Anderson is the, sorry, I'll try to talk into this, where Matt Anderson is the node director. Um, and many of the people in this room have participated in the brain research. I don't know, Janine and, um, well, Carolyn left. But, um, and the main kind of way that we're trying to get individuals registered with the program is the, um, the idea that they're superheroes, right? So they've made not a commitment, but they've made kind of expressed an interest in donating their brains or their children's brains after death. Um, and it isn't a commitment again. People think that we're going to chase after them when they die and make this decision for them. And I have to remind them that there's like a handful of people working on this project and no one's tracking anybody down. So um, there was a MOA signed with the Duke 15 that um, the brain tissue would be handled by Autism Brain Net. Um, those with autism go into Autism Brain Net and the ones without autism go to the um, repository in, at University of Maryland. Um, so currently there's a total of 232 donors um, with, and that includes everybody. So that includes grandparents and siblings and controls from say medical examiners and OPOs. There are nine dupe 15 and autism. So you can imagine the limited amount of research that's been able to be done so far. And I'm just gonna talk about it briefly. Um, so this is a, uh, a uh, uh, study by, done by Janine LaSalle and her student, um, is it Margaret Mitchell? Michelle Mitchell, um, that was published a few years ago that shows that the PCB levels in brain tissue were higher in those with um, a genetic neurodevelopmental disorder. So those are the orange lines. And most of those cases were of dupe 15. So for whatever reason, individuals with dupe 15 had higher levels of PCBs in their brain, which kind of opens up the idea that environmental factors may play a bigger role. And again, you know, again, this still needs to be studied, and Janine has been studying it, um, has been further studying it, especially in um, looking at methylation. So as it turns out, um, the region of chromosome 15 that's affected in those with dupe 15 um, is mostly hypomethylated. Not There is some hypermethylation, but it's mostly hypomethylation. Um, and so th that sense of being the change in methylation may actually interact with genetic factors to further change gene expression or produce changes that were not expected. But Janine is the expert on that topic. Um, so uh, Dan Geshwin's lab has looked at gene transcription in this region in brain tissue and then also um, transcription, the pattern of, of um, gene regulation outside this region in people with autism without the mutation. And as you can see, Obviously, no surprise here, within that dupe 15 region, um, there is a dysregulation of genes. You can see those are the blue dots um, that you would completely expect. But outside those regions, the, um, the pattern or the clustering of gene expression stays relatively the same. So um, it's not ex exact that everybody has the same gene expression levels, but the patterning and the clustering of the genes seem to be about the same outside that 15Q region. Um, another finding that was particularly interesting 
was done by Yerzy Vengel's lab at uh, Institute of Basic Research that found an accumulation of beta amyloid plaque formation in individuals with DUP15 that weren't necessarily there um, in people without DUP15 and autism. Um, you know, again, the sample size wasn't huge, but it did suggest there may be some sort of accelerating aging process going on in DUP15, but obviously this is something that needs to be replicated. Um, there's also, this is what Carolyn alluded to um, yesterday, a higher rate, and this is evidence of, here let me, this is evidence of dysplasia in the hippocampus and then heterotopias in the hippocampus and the amygdala um, of individuals with DUP15. They have a 22 higher rate of dysplasia compared to those without, uh, without DUP15 but also having autism. Um, also, just looking at their brain size, there's, they have um, higher rates of microcephaly than people without DUP15 and autism. And the authors in this paper um, suggested that th these changes may help explain SUDEP and, and intellectual disability, but I, I think there's a caveat there and I would explain it at the end. Um, they also have, so typically, um, in early adult, like between the ages of four to say 15, you'll see smaller cell sizes in those with autism. You don't see this in this graph because they looked at ages eight to 33, so the effect may have been washed out. But the dupe 15, um, even without autism, have smaller uh, soma sizes, and that effect is exacerbated with autism. So they actually have smaller cell sizes compared to those with autism. And so um, I kind of wanted to think about whether or not this told a story, and I'm not sure if it does, because obviously brain tissue is not longitudinal, it's cross-sectional. Um, the donors are usually not part of any sort of clinical assessment, so a lot of the things like IQ or um, you know, even cause of death can be sometimes difficult to ascertain, um, and the sample size is small. Obviously, we need more studies. Um, but the neuropathology, and actually what I heard from Charlotte's talk, is consistent with this idea of um, neurologically gent more gentle mutations in those with the common variant. So if you have a, common vari a set of common variants, they're thought to be more neurologically gentle than those with the highly penetrant rare variants which seem to have more of a striking effect. Um, and I want to say this was not my theory. This was Elise Robinson in a, in a recent paper. And then Janine's data opens doors to gene-environment interactions, which I think most people had were normally assumed were um, restricted to those with multiple common variants, the rare variants being you know, that genetic variant was the thing that um, caused, that was, had the most impact. And then um, this is an opportunity to look at SUDEP. Um, however, in doing a quick research you know, review of people without DUP15 and SUDEP, there seem to be already some differences that you know, I, I don't, probably we need to study more. Um, there's huge issues in matching. You, know, you don't choose the cause of death of people. So um, you see that most people in um, the DUP15 group have SUDEP as a cause of death, whereas um, with idiopathic autism, um, you know, seizure-related deaths are, are, are less common. Um, so the changes that you see in the brain, are they related to SUDEP? Are they related to DUP15? And then also, there's just not a lot of information. Um, there seems to be more information about um, the level of intellectual impairment in donors with DUP15 because they tend to have more of a robust evaluation history. Whereas with those um, with autism, there's a lot of information that's not known about intellectual uh, ability. So again, it could explain those differences or it could be a confounding factor. Um, I'm gonna wrap up by thanking the researchers in this room who, who have worked on this tissue, specifically Dan's lab and his student Neil Parashak, Janine, um, and others. Um, and also, of course, the families who make this heroic decision. You know, it's a really, it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm interested in getting more information. Um, it's another thing to actually make the call 
when this happens. And so we're really grateful for them to them because it is, you know, a, a huge thing to do. And then um, all the ABN staff, specifically Carolyn Hare, director of clinical operations, who goes to each family who goes, you know, who, who travels to each family and obtains as much information as they can from that family at a time when it's really a really difficult and devastating time. So that's it. I told you I'd be quick.